Good day, spiritual artists. I wanted to take a moment and share this short video and do something a little different. So if you've been wondering what my art looks like after all these years, you might have been listening to my podcast where I interview other artists and I talk about their art. And you might have even seen me talk about my art in my book, The Spiritual Artist, but I've kind of shied away from maybe showing my art. Uh, right behind me is one of my paintings in a certain series that I've designed, but I wanted to talk to you about the principle behind the, the Spiritual Artist book, what I learned from writing the book, and also what I learned about myself. So what is important to me? What is important to me is to find that unique creative DNA in everyone, because I know that we all are totally unique creators. And so as I wrote the book and started uncovering how do I get there? How do I get to that place when I'm in front of the easel and I just feel inspired and, and something, some greater power by any name that you want to call it is flowing through me with me. And we are co-creating a painting or a piece of art or writing because this occurs in any creative process. And so I realized that you have to as I talk about, you calm your mind, you watch your thoughts. I'm learning now to actually feel my body and feel what my body feels like. Is it open? Is it, am I using the proper use of self with my body? All of those things come into play and your emotions. How do you navigate emotions? All those things come into play when you create. But what I realized is when I started following all those and practicing them, I would start uncovering different styles, different people that were in with me, different styles of work. So I'm going to share a couple of my series. You can find them on my website under the portfolio page, some of the recent pictures. I have been painting since uh, 2000. And honestly, the first 10 years, it was kind of mindless painting. I just did what I did. And it wasn't until my mentor, Virginia Cobb, told me one day to watch my process, watch how I work in the studio that I started paying attention to how I work and started uncovering these different styles. My square one series was really a method to watch my thoughts. I wanted to realize how my thoughts were affecting what I was painting. And so I started, and you'll see this, you can watch my Asemic drawing video about scribbling and drawing from that. But in this series, I was very basic. I would just load colors on and I'll show you these in a minute and they'll slide over the screen. And then I just did edges, straight edges, horizontal, vertical, cutting and cutting and shaping and cutting shapes. And you'll see in these series that once you really consciously focus on what you're doing and you're not rushing to the future and you're not thinking about the past, you come up with some beautiful work. I, I love this series. It was the first show I had. It's probably been, oh, oh, it's scary. Eight years ago, nine years ago, I had a solo show featuring the Square One series. So part of that series was what I call a light series. And as I played with doing these square shapes, I started noticing that I was creating a, a way for light to reflect off the painting. And in the light series, I used whites and darks next to each other, and they actually grab the light. What's really interesting in these paintings is that you can see when the light moves across the room, perhaps if you hang one of these paintings in a hallway by a front door, you get a different feeling throughout the day. I, I was thrilled with these paintings. The light series shows how light reflects with your stroke. And it's something you should be aware of as a painter. How does light hit your stroke? I'm gonna talk a minute just about this painting behind me. It's a newer series and I'll talk about it at the end. But you can see by using these highlights of white where the light is actually grabbed in the room and it pulls it to the front, that same theory is used in my light series. I love doing my light series. And you know what? I still am inspired. And occasionally I will go back, pick up the brush, and I'll do a painting in that light series. So as an artist, you are going to find and discover different aspects of yourself, different styles. And you can stay with one style. A lot of gallery owners want you to keep with one style, or you can let yourself experiment, or you can sell one style or series and keep the other for personal use. Me, I love expanding and always trying new things. So another series in here, and it's, a, it's kind of a takeoff, those squares, I started wanting to bring curve into my work. 
And this is my orb series, big shapes, big strokes, big circular shapes. I started incorporating circles into my design. So as you can see, I kind of went all the way back, all the way back to being like a young child where you're just learning to do simple brush strokes, straight up and down, right and left. Then you work with shadow and depth. Then you add curve to make it more interesting. And that's when I started realizing that there was an edge. There was a sharp edge in a lot of my paintings. And so that's when I came up with the Gaussian, Gaussian, I have trouble with that word, series. That's where I paint almost wet onto wet. And I get this beautiful blurring of colors. People love this series. It's very popular. Um, I will tell you, it's not the one I feel most closely aligned with. I love it. When I feel it, it, it works. But it doesn't feel necessarily unique to me. I feel like it's represented in the market a lot. And so I enjoy it and it's marketable, but it's not my favorite series. And I do return to it here and again. In fact, I'm going to do a show upcoming in the fall. I'm going to do a couple panels in that. This next series, and it's, it's this one behind me is kind of a riff off of it or, or was the predecessor to it. It's called the Bold Series. It's when I started playing with line and stroke. And I'm going to slide some pictures in here so you can see what I mean. These beautiful lines shaping. And this is really about shapes. I'm focusing on the shapes and how they move on the, on the canvas or the board. And the line, not only how it can't be an even line. So I will tell you this as an artist, predictable ba balance can be boring. So if you draw line work and it's straight and it's always equal, it's going to be boring. So make sure it has varied widths. Make sure you go in and out on the depth. And I literally was looking at an older painting the other day, and I noticed one spot where I never fixed that. The whole shape was totally even, and it just stuck out to me. So make sure that when you're working with lines, that you always vary the width of them. That's a great tip for you. So I also did a whole series. I love this series. It's still fun for me. I'm doing a show this fall, and I have one in it called The Modular. This is where I get rid of the line. I didn't want to have those sharp black lines. I wanted to have things bumping up to each other. Now, there's still definition because two shapes of different color hit. There is a line, but there's not a black line or a dark line or a white line. There's nothing clear cut breaking them. It's just how they touch. And I loved how they touched and, and reacted to each other. So another aspect as a painter is noticing how your sharp edges hit your soft edges. How do they blend? Do they decal? Do you allow them to be messy? And I'll tell you something, it's more interesting when they're messy. So I got to a period and I do some that are very clean and very tight and I'll overlay, I'll overpaint it and overpaint it until it's so tight. But you know what I found out? It's more interesting when it's kind of torn, decal. And so sometimes I'll go back and actually deco it afterward, but you can play with that line. It's not permanent, especially with acrylic. You can do the line, come up back over it two hours later and change it. So don't feel that you're stuck with one type of line. Um, this is a fun series that I came up with and it's a variation of all these. And it was based on painting on some three-dimensional object. And I call it my box series and it led to my totem series. These, as you can see in these paintings, they have a deep edge. I had them specially made. My box series are sometimes seven inches deep and they stick off the wall and I literally paint all the way around them. The reason I did these box series is I was fascinated by how does that straight edge line, how does it curve around a bend? How do, how do I understand how the curve would work around a bend? And better yet, I realized that when I finished this, the viewer gets an incredible experience by viewing it from different sides. Hopefully I can install a clip here. When you're seeing that painting from the left, I started playing with over on that side, they, it starts with a white background, but as they move around, it translates into a different color background. It makes it so much more interesting. If that is on display in a public space, you get a different experience as you walk around it. So consider that playing with some painting on something that's three-dimensional or has some depth to it. It's a great way to make a painting more interesting and also to challenge you as an artist. So a spiritual artist, for me, doesn't just rest and do the same thing over and over again. Being a spiritual artist is about growth. 
you want to expand that skill. You want to challenge yourself. And when you get to a point where you're bored, trust me, the painting will show it. When you are bored, the viewer is bored. If you're pushing yourself ahead, even though it's scary, and I'm working on one right now that's kind of challenging me, it's going to make for an exciting painting. The scarier it is, the more challenging it is, the more the viewer will sense that you are really present and focused on it, and you were really there and fighting with it. And that's interesting. They want to see an artist that has fought a little bit with their painting. So don't be afraid to challenge yourself. Finally, the series I'm working on right now, and it's never going to end, I'm going to evolve and evolve these series as I grow, is the Primitive Conversations. This is a sample of the Primitive Conversations. This painting is actually called Creative DNA. Primitive Conversations, as you notice in these paintings, involves me doing this line work that feels almost like writing. It's like I've created my own language. I realized that as I started playing with shape and line, that certain shapes were coming to me naturally, that I'm attracted to certain curves, certain levels, maybe two shapes together, one bigger than the other. And so I felt like when I was doing this painting behind me, that it's almost like instead of writing with the alphabet, I'm writing with shapes across the page. This is, a, this is probably one of my most exciting uh, styles and series right now. And maybe that's because it's the newest one. And so for me, I am still on the cutting edge. And, and when I get bored and when, I, when it becomes too easy, when I can just whip one out, I'm going to have to move and let myself go into a different direction to keep my interest there. So as you need, notice in these primitive series, I love them. There's kind of a feeling of a writing something. And what I realized was so interesting about this is that feeling covered a whole, I could paint a large canvas and that same type of language was going all over the canvas, meaning that that writing was, was native to me. It's sort of like my primitive my primitive language. That's why it's called primitive conversations. So I hope you enjoyed this little walk down my history in the last 10 years as I've evolved and found these different, different series within. And the greatest thing you should remember is you can always take something you learn from one, maybe the blurred edges, and now I'm experimenting with that in the primitive conversation series, and challenge yourself more. So as you design new tools and build your toolbox, you can pick and choose. I want to tell you that you can always pick and choose. You don't have to always take the same tool out. If you are painting with the same size brush and you've been painting with that same size brush over and over again, I ask you to put it down and grab a larger brush or a very small brush and challenge yourself to move in a different area. If you've been using the same color over and over again, I challenge you to try a color you don't like. I love telling people that try the color that you don't like the most and use it. So all of these ways are how to explore and expand. First, you have to go back and, and understand the, the, the theories in the book, the spiritual artist. You have to understand to learn to watch what you're thinking when you work. You've got to feel your body and how it feels when you work. You've got to be present to your emotions, but you aren't your emotions. They flow through you. All of those things happen in front of the easel and practicing the state of a spiritual artist is what this is all about and i tell you what's the best surprise is that state goes out into the real life and you start realizing it that you can use those same techniques when you're in a conversation with your boss or when you're having an argument with someone or whether you're out on a date those same techniques are valid as a spiritual artist so thanks for watching i hope you enjoyed seeing some of my work and stay tuned. Please follow this channel. It is growing fast. I'm excited. I'm going to start doing retreats. I'm doing one this fall. There'll be more to come. And if you follow me or if you email me and get added to my newsletter list, I will, I will keep you on there and you'll know when my next retreat is because I love teaching these principles and I love helping people become more conscious, mindful creators. Thanks again. Talk to you soon. I'm a spiritual artist.